right, let's go straight to it there now. One of the questions that we have, and I think it's very much related, is what are some of the implications that black liberation theology can have on public theology? Uh, black liberation theology and public theology. I'm not sure. It's probably a text question, so I don't really know the background. But black liberation theology, first of all, originated amongst pastors. July 31st, 1966, uh, 47 African-American men and one woman, Anna Hedgeman, who were not professors, not academics. So many say that the black church in America produced the only theology indigenous to North America that did not arise out of the church. So all, and they published on July 31st, 1966, a theological interpretation of black power called the Black Power Statement that simultaneously ran July 31st, 1966 in the New York Times and the LA Times. So by definition, uh, black theology liberation is public theology. So that's why I wasn't clear what they meant by that. Uh, what's the relationship between the two? To be a black liberation theologian is to proclaim thus saith the Lord, and it is to witness both as prophetic ministry, as priestly ministry, and as practical ministry, prophet, priest, and king. And the Bible says, <laughs> you know, that uh, that one, that anointed one, was a public leader. He was, assass he was lynched on a wooden tree as a public leader. He lived in a period of Roman empire. That's right. He gave his life for those who were outcasts, the prostitutes. Uh, he turned water into wine. I know y'all don't be drinking it full of butter. <laughs> <laughs> he was a party animal. Yes. In public. So the word of God, that the one who reveals the word of God, the one who is the word of God, to me is public. So both in terms of the actual historical development of black liberation theology that started before Cohn and others and Hopkins, the pastors, they were public, and also at least my interpretation of the Bible that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is a public person. But th there's a sense in which black theology lives in the academy. Uh, I know that historically you've mentioned that um, it started with the black church, but there's a sense in which a lot of the things that we talk about is not kind of filtered down to the black church movement or integrates into the kind of struggles, like in Black Lives Matter, for example, that kind of thing. Any, any thoughts on that, anybody? Well, I think that's very interesting. I think that's part of the reflection that we must help African-American expressions of Christianity and churches do. And, you know, this whole setting reminds me that this is the kind of reflection I must help my church engage in. And I think that's part of the reason why some of black theology or some of the insights of black theology hasn't been as resonant within the African-American church experience because it has not been reflected upon and articulated. But also, the black church is, the African-American church typically is very biblocentric and very centered on the gospel. And so sometimes uh, we, we, don't, we don't see uh, the relationships between the insights of ourselves as African-American Christians and our experience with the gospel. And so uh, I think those are some of the missing pieces. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just add that okay, there, there, there might uh, just be a, a, a few features of black liberation, liberation theology um, uh, that uh, makes it distinctive, but probably in comparison to, to public uh, theology, and that also kind of goes against our programming, which which kind of adds an edge to it. Uh, one is one is uh, as as uh, Dr. Owens pointed out that God God has a preference, a preference for the poor, which which um, kind of again goes against what we have been taught. You know, God has no God is no respecter of of persons. But then to hear the radical notion that God might have a preference. Uh, for, for the poor. It's one of the distinctives of black theology. And not only that, but God identifies 
with with the poor also uh which kind of gives it uh somewhat what of edge and and, uh, and of course uh James Cone drawing upon Henry Turner who probably went went even further to, to say something even more radical namely that God is black you know if, if God identifies with the poor and who are the poorest of the poor especially in the United States uh black people and and uh uh, Cone uh, drew from that 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 God is black, and I, and we can we can debate whether or not that's just a metaphor or 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 some kind of theological statement, but but it's those those kind of things that I okay. think. And this is an interesting question here. It says um, there's much talk in progressive Christian circles about the apparent evils of materialism, especially as it relates to rampant and unbridled capitalism. Uh, in this light, is is there room for a critique of the project of capitalism? So, uh, in so far as it is immersed in whiteness, as defined by Willie Jennings this time last year. Thus, uh, is there a means by which wealth might be acquired, distributed without utilization of historically apparently destructive capitalistic means? Dr. Hopkins. <laughs> Look at me. So a critique. Well, can, can I say this? I think we're seeing it. It's, it. There are some very creative ways that, I'll say younger people, that are doing different projects, are learning how to create wealth at the same time that they're taking care of human needs or taking care of needs of the planet, et cetera, et cetera. So there are ways, and, and this is what I'm trying to allude to through the power of the Holy Spirit. How do we take advantage of what people know now and are experiencing being good at and also seeking God? How do we overcome poverty and create abundance and wealth uh, with, with, without the problems and mistakes of a, a, a rapid, a vavid, you know, uh, uh, capitalism. Okay. Right. Any other comments? Thanks so much for that. Uh, no, I would agree with that. And I think, yes, there are examples. And also, it's a redemptive moment, right? It need, It's almost as if there are certain aspects to capitalism that may be useful, but we see the problems in which it's just about getting more for myself and for my own. So the principles are problematic. I do think we need to look at more communal models, which is part of what I was saying, I think part of what you've highlighted as well. But it starts from the beginning, the inception, right? Who are you doing this for? Is it to improve your own, or is it really to make for a better world? That makes a difference. I'm going to ask you to respond, but I want you to add to this piece to it. What do you think Dr. King would tell us about how to address gentrification in our cities? Gentrification. Yeah. yeah, I think that, uh, you know, Dr. King has been, what, many, many, this is the 41st year after his, it's been a long time, right? Uh, so it's hard to say what would he have done, but if we pick up on the trajectory, his theological trajectory of his ministry, as Dr. Owens say, he is a minister. Um, I think he would uh, be concerned about the humanity of all people, but he would prioritize his interpretation of Jesus' priority, as Dr. Watts said, for, for the poor. And so, I mean, I could imagine programmatically some type of mixed housing or mixed resources because we have to, things are going to, that, that anger, that displacement of home, that people are going in the Bay Area and apparently in LA and in Chicago uh, is taking place. It, that's, that's not going to go away. That's, that's going to come out sideways. So even for the health of all folk and the planet, we need to attend to the poor just on pragmatic reasons, let alone for me as a theologian, a Christian on Christian grounds. So some way to pragmatically design urban planning such that we have mixed housing and we give first priority on people who are being removed to be part of the rebuilding as workers, as architects. We need to also provide a preferential option for their kids for education including summer camps and visiting Africa and things like that. So we have to take into consideration, the, I, I think King was concerned about all people's humanity. Mm -hmm. And one way to, lev to, to lift up all people's humanity is to prioritize the poor. Because if you touch the poor, it opens up a universal love. That's the key there. It's through that particularity to the poor that we get to all humanity. Because they have nothing but their faith. That was part of the preferential option that we think that Jesus has for the poor 
is because the only thing they have to hold on is their faith. They don't own an island. They don't own, you know, companies. And I'm not necessarily poo-pooing people who have global corporations, but part of the preferential option of God in Christ in the Holy Spirit is because the poor have only their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the preciousness of the poor, not their state of poverty. That's the, that's the, that's the theological kernel there when we talk about preferential option of the poor because the, the faith they have in the covenant that God has provided for them because they have nothing else to hold on to. The other thing I want to mention just briefly is that what we're saying about, I'm working on a project called Theology of Wealth, and one of the first courses I get is like, oh my God, he's gone totally wild now. He was a liberation theologian. So I'm not saying that, I'm not blaming the poor for being poor because they don't have enough faith in prosperity. That's not, so let me just, I'm speaking generically. I know I'm in LA and Atlanta, but I'm not so many, but that's not what we're saying. We're not saying anything about, because my understanding of a certain type of gospel, you blame the poor for not having enough faith in Jesus, therefore they don't have wealth. That's, I'm not saying that, so let me just put that there, right? We're saying that the resources that God has created, earth, air, and water, the poor should have access to that. Wealth for me is earth, air, and water, and that the poor should have access to that. Now we can talk about, and I don't mean, you notice I don't use capitalism, I've given up that language <laughs> like Cornell West, you don't talk. I'll just get down to what it means on the ground, right? And how we want to carve it up and how we want to split it up and how we want to distribute it, we're just saying that theologically, the poor and working people, and we would also say women too, uh, who are disadvantaged, single moms, et cetera, the largest citizens on welfare in the United States are single white women. Don't want to talk about that. <laughs> That's a fact. Um, so they're part of the poor, that coalition that King was building at the end. That's why we focus on the poor. Yes. And we can call it whatever we want, you know, but I've, I don't, I stop engaging in the names now, you know. But also the issue about gentrification, the biblical uh, um, principle in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, because you were a slave, because you were uh, a foreigner, you are to be good to the foreigner. You are to be good to the slave. You are to love your neighbor as yourself. So one of the things that I believe the church needs to advocate for is as communities gentrify, as, they, uh, as their economic base increases, as maybe different ethnicities come in, that the church must be about instructing and guiding people to make space for those who are the least in the world there and that it makes for a better community, a better world uh, in, in, in that space. Okay, Dr. Walters, I'm going to direct this question at you. It says, how do we translate King's intersection of spirituality and justice to today's social justice issues? We no longer are fighting against segregated bathrooms, but there's, there's mass incarceration and other economic disparities. The wealth gap is shrinking. At the same time, it seems as though black people of color have more opportunities than ever. Yet the staggering statistic reminds us that this is not the case. How do we approach this? Yeah, well, I think King would, well, like even today, uh, he would he would espouse a, a systemic approach uh, to, the, to the problems uh, that, that we're facing even today, like, like mass uh, incarceration, increasing uh, poverty, uh, still uh, displacement of, of, of peoples. He would say that there are, again, systematic forces, ingrained forces in society that cause these things uh, that happen. I think even t today he would excuse the, t the es excuse the tendency to to blame the victim again for their for their uh, situation, and he would look for these hidden causes. Okay, thank um, Dr. Abinath. I'm going to direct this question at you. He says, um, "It seems the American church enjoys reductionist versions of Jesus and MLK. And somebody mentioned that one that removes or at least refuses to focus on." a concern for the poor. How can we reclaim a biblical Jesus and an actual MLK who stresses the need for our theology to include a focus on poverty? Absolutely, that's a huge question. Um, one of the things I would ask, I, was, I would enter it into, because Jesus speaks about this so clearly, which has been articulated in so many ways, and because Dr. King speaks about these issues. Why are we deaf? 
So that means we are defending. That's how I would look at it psycho psychologically. We are ignoring. We're not looking at the full truth. So then I'd ask strategically, what purpose is that serving? So that serves some purpose for people that are gaining more wealth. But this is the other side that if we don't feel that we should be possessing it, you see how that works together? So both of those positions and probably many others need to be shifted. But yeah, it is the whole council. It's, it's there. It's in the word. And so then we wonder, are we really hearing the full council? Are we hearing the word of God? Are we studying that? Are we taking it in? Because we can't miss that in God's word. I'm going to close on this question to you, Dr. Upkin. Yes. It says, please discuss how inter- and intra-related damage done to the self-esteem of the black community intersects with embracing the prosperity gospel. <laughs> I was trying to avoid talking about the prosperity. God, he's breaking on back. <laughs> he's doing the Oprah thing here. But, but, um, but, but, but yeah. you, you, when you think about the prosperity mm -hmm. gospel, you see that yeah, yeah, is yeah. there a relationship between that and the kind of yeah, you know, I'm at the point, maybe I'm getting old and slower and more gray hair and less hair, that I, you know, I don't categorize categories and people, you know, I talk about there's exceptions everywhere. So God shines light in all darkness. I think about institutions and cultures and structures, but I would never do an ad hominem attack on any, any person. Um, I think that there are folks who um, misinterpret the word of God whatever motivation it is, to equate self-critique as the reason for lack of faith in God's word. I think that's really a very serious problem when we start blaming people. And, um, and so folk who are broken in terms of domestic violence, in terms of sexual abuse, in terms of fathers missing in their homes, in terms of three strikes shot mass incarceration, in terms of lack of housing because of gentrification. And despite the black public leaders at the top, uh, the majority of people are facing African-Americans and all people and white workers too, are the effects of a redistribution mm -hmm. of wealth. So if we have people who are suffering and struggling, and then we have leaders who blame them their suffering and struggling, spiritually, psychologically, physically, if, on faith, to me, that's very damaging. So I think there is a relationship between the two. What I try to do is less and less spend time on that and try to provide models of what we can do to walk to walk and talk to talk. For example, I think the whole spirit of this 72 hours I'm here and this evening is a beautiful example. On the one hand, we could have spent 90% critiquing prosperity gospel and others, but what we did is we shared our stories and our interpretation of how we think we should move forward. So I think that's more and more energy should shift there. But I do think it's damning and very harmful to people who are always struggling and then to link a, a critique of their faith on top of that. Yes. Additionally. I knew you would jump in on this one. <laughs> additionally, the Bible says that God is a provider. Our African-American Christian ancestors believed that God would provide for them in the nadar, in the midst of slavery. And they believed that one day they would be set free. They believed it and they worked on that. That is why you and I are free today. There were people who wanted to hold our ancestors and their children coming after in slavery in per perpetuity in America. But when God raised up a Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement after many, many years of abolitionist work, et cetera, et cetera, and finally we got over legal slavery, then beyond racist, apartheid, segregation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, our people saw that as God's work within us by faith in God. And so God does provide, God does help us in this world, it may not happen now, <laughs> but we are to believe that God does provide, God does help. So I think it's better to talk about God's provision. It, it, it's not that it just happens now, immediately, that we may not, that we will or we will not suffer. We, we, we had thousands, millions of African Christians 
in slavery, who died in slavery. But eventually, someone came through. That's a good place to end. Put your hands together for our speakers.